Well, let me bring you into our closed library stacks. This is a research collection, so uh, nothing ever leaves here. The public doesn't get to come into the stacks. Uh, uh, they have things paged for them. Um, but this is a 500,000 volume collection, so this is just one of the levels of our library stacks. And um, I like to think of it as a library of libraries. Uh, we have an incredible collection of Native American material, uh, which is especially rich in the Dakota and Ojibwe, the Minnesota um, uh, Native Americans. We have uh, a nearly complete collection of books uh, from the 19th century on the Civil War uh, and uh, leading up to that on the abolitionist uh, movement. So this is a little bit of a glimpse. What, uh, what I've done is pulled some of my favorites, some of the things that I consider uh, treasures and, uh, and love, and I'm gonna uh, show those to you individually. We could probably start, I guess, a good place would be with our map collection. We have a collection of almost 50,000 maps, and they go from the mid-1500s to maps that were probably uh, on the press yesterday afternoon. We get, uh, we get maps daily. Uh, and <coughs> the, this is a map from 1581, and I like starting with this when, I'm, uh, when I've got a group of school kids because there's no here here. If you look in the center of the continent, there's not a single Great Lake, there isn't a Mississippi River, there's nothing known about the interior of the continent. And what the Minnesota Historical Society likes to do is to fill in that information to the point where we know every square inch of land and who owns it. So we have uh, what helps us fill in that, uh, that gap are all of our maps from uh, travel and exploration and discovery. This is the map that accompanied the Lewis and Clark report and, uh, and a pretty significant uh, event in uh, U.S. cartography. This shows that it isn't gonna be too easy to get across the continent. You see that range of mountains from uh, the Rockies. We also have this, uh, um, uh, probably my favorite item in the collection is this, uh, it's popularly known as the uh, Bodmer Atlas. Uh, this accompanied a trip up the Missouri River by Prince Maximilian von Weed, and Bodmer was a Swiss artist and, and trained as an artist, so you get some, um, uh, some quality that doesn't exist in the other artist's renderings. Bodmer is just, uh, uh, it, it's just so beautiful and so detailed, you can count almost uh, the beadwork and the uh, porcupine quills in all of these costumes. The one thing that uh, people probably don't think about the Minnesota Historical Society is that we are not only collecting Minnesota history, but we're, we're here to preserve Minnesota culture. And one of the ways that we preserve Minnesota culture is to collect literature. Uh, but what we like to do is collect the books that have some um, additional information, something that uh, a, a normal library wouldn't have. So a lot of libraries would have Sinclair Lewis's Cass Timberlane. Um, we have the copy that he has given to this radical Duluth judge who was the model for the judge in Cass. Uh, and his name was uh, Judge Nolan, Mark Nolan. And uh, so we know that about him. Plus that came with photos that Judge Nolan had taken of a picnic with uh, Sinclair Lewis on the North Shore of Lake Superior above Duluth. And I think they were trying to set Sinclair Lewis up with uh, Judge Nolan's secretary. So she's the other person in the, in the photographs. He's writing in the, well, he had a long, a nice long career. He was, uh, he was writing in the late teens. Um, um, and then in the 20s, uh, he wrote uh, his breakthrough book was Main Street, and uh, that's uh, essential reading for any Minnesotan. Um, the, uh, the, the author that most people associate with uh, Minnesota and St. Paul in particular is, of course, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. And the Minnesota Historical Society just loves to document, uh, especially the early life, the early career of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and Fitz uh, kind of before he becomes uh, a, a superstar. 
So I have a couple of uh, fun things here that are, uh, that are from that time period, and, uh, and I'll take a little time to, to show those to you. Um, he published first in his, uh, in his uh, school, um, you know, and, well, I guess a newsletter or something, and we have all of that. Uh, this I just love because this is a junior high school textbook from, um, that was printed in 1911, and just kind of a crummy little book that you'd, you know, if anybody, if anybody sold this, it wouldn't be for more than a buck or two. And uh, we paid $25,000 for this. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because it um, uh, was owned by uh, Francis Scott Fitzgerald. And there are some marginal notes in here and some marginal drawings. And that's kind of fun. Uh, but the really important thing here is the last page of this and the text, uh, if I can read that to you, is just uh, kind of um, makes you slap your forehead. So he says, Francis Scott Fitzgerald, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, and he describes himself. Playwright, poet, novelist, essayist, philosopher, loafer, useless, disagreeable, silly, talented, weak, strong, clever, trivial, a waste, in short, a very parody, a mockery of one who might have been more, but whom nature and circumstances made less, with apologies for living, Francis Scott Fitzgerald. And then you get this flourish at the end of it. It's so, uh, it's, it's the best combination of a 15-year-old boy <laughs> and somebody who's really uh, more insightful than the, uh, than the rest of us. So I think he kind of nails himself. Uh, we also have, um, uh, speaking of early stuff, he, he was asked in, um, in the fall of 1919, uh, the librarian, a librarian at St. Paul Public Library was trying to uh, get um, just stay on top of local writers. So, uh, so um, F. Scott Fitzgerald was one of them, and he's uh, and he's saying kind of that he's um, he's got books in the uh, in the work and short stories, and and he's uh, he's very certain he's going to become a um, a, uh, a writer someday, <laughs> as is uh, his his military service record. Uh, and, and this is kind of fun because um, they ask uh, your occupation and he writes, was student, am now writer. So he's, uh, he's sure of that. Uh, we just got this letter that is kind of fun. Uh, it comes out, uh, the letter was written a month before his first book comes out and he's writing, he's trying to hire a, a clipping service in, uh, in New York and uh, he's telling the clipping service that he's a brand new author and he was an overnight sensation with this book, uh, but a month before the book came out, uh, he was so unimportant that the clipping service uh, acknowledges receipt of the letter and writes with, um, without reply, and they underline that. They, did, they didn't even uh, get back to him on that. Uh, another, uh, like the Sinclair Lewis, we like books that add information uh, that uh, wasn't known before. Uh, this is really um, uh, an, a great example of that. This is The Beautiful and Damned, and he's uh, inscribed this to Norris Dean Jackson, who was a boyhood friend of his in St. Paul, and say uh, basically that the, uh, the main protagonist in here is modeled on uh, Norris Dean Jackson. And so that kind of information is really important to us. The Historical Society, uh, again, you know, I think we have this, uh, this image of being a very um, formal institution, but the library loves collecting pulp fiction, so we have paperback uh, editions. This is a, a comic book that was uh, published in St. Paul, uh, a Catholic comic book. Um, and the interesting thing about this is this has the first printed cartoon ever of Charles Schultz. In the, uh, in the back of it. Just keep laughing by Sparky. This was his, his home. He, um, he grew up on the corner of Snelling and uh, Selby. His dad was a barber. He, was, uh, he went to school, Central High School. He stayed here uh, pretty, 
you know, well into his, uh, his uh, formative career and then moved out to, uh, to California. Uh, I don't remember, or I, th I think that was um, uh, a decision of his, of his wife's, but uh, he's, he's just very, um, uh, very St. Paul. I think the, uh, the thing that I love about this collection is that you could come in and find out any aspect of, of Minnesota, you know, whether it's sports history or business history or immigrant history, and, uh, and you can find things that are uh, unique enough to make you very proud to be a St. Paulite or, or a Minnesotan, uh, you know, like this early Fitzgerald stuff. But I also think that, uh, that there's enough depth there that what you really walk away understanding is that you have a common humanity with everybody else. Your experience is not different than, and your grandparents' experiences aren't different than the, uh, than the recent immigrants. And, uh, and we're all uh, impacted by the place that we, that we grew up. So I really like the, um, the fact that you can uh, learn not only your differences, but your similarities to everybody else in the world. And, and I think that's one of the important, one of the many important aspects of, uh, of history and what history can tell us.